want to talk today about the life of Peter. And I read a lot about Peter in the Gospels and certainly don't have time to go through all of them. Take a couple hours at least to read all the texts relating to Peter. So what I want to do is condense it down to a few key texts that uh, indicate something about his, uh, his life and his uh, career as an evangelist. And to begin with, uh, you know, Peter's pretty important. And one, one, we, one way we know that, he was the very first disciple uh, called by Jesus. We read this in Mark, first chapter, uh, beginning with the 14th verse. And after John had been taken into custody, Jesus came into Galilee, preaching the gospel of God and saying, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. And as he was going along by the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and Andrew, the brother of Simon, casting a net in the sea, for they were fishermen. And Jesus said to them, Follow me, and I will make you become fishers of men. And they immediately left the nets and followed him. Of course, Simon is Peter. As with many of the people in the Bible, they had uh, two names that they referred to. And a little bit later then, uh, Jesus took up residence at Peter's house in Capernaum, still in Mark 1, skipping to the 29th verse. And immediately after they had come out of the synagogue, they came into the house of Simon and Andrew with James and John. Now Simon, Simon's mother-in-law was lying sick with a fever, and immediately they spoke to him about her, and he came to her and raised her up, taking her by the hand, and the fever left her. And she began to wait on them. And when evening had come, after the sun had set, they began bringing to him all who were ill and those who were demon-possessed, and the whole city had gathered at the door. So Jesus moved in, basically, with Peter. Now, I have to remember, in those days, you didn't have single-family residences. Uh, dwellings in Capernaum, and we saw the, uh, when we were there, the excavations of what they claim is Peter's house. Uh, it was a courtyard surrounded by uh, single, uh, single roof rooms. And so if you added somebody out, there was an extended family that lived there. You had Peter, you had his brother, you had his mother-in-law, and now Jesus. So when they wanted to add more space, they could just build an extra room around this courtyard. And the courtyard was walled in with a door in it, and that's where they did uh, their uh, work, whatever their profession was, making sandals or whatever, they would do it in that courtyard because it's pretty hot in that part uh, of Israel in the summer, and so they wanted to be outside, not inside a room. Of course, they had no air conditioning in those days, and they said, uh, and when we visited Capernaum, they told us that frequently in those days, if it was hot at night, they would just bring their pallets out into the courtyard and sleep out there rather than in their own rooms. So this became Jesus' home for the next uh, couple of years. And we know that because uh, following part in here in, in uh, uh, Mark talks about Jesus traveling around the countryside for a few days. And at the beginning of the second chapter, uh, <clears throat> we read, and when he had come back to Capernaum several days afterward, it was heard that he was at home. So in other words, Peter's house is now Jesus' home. And many were gathered together, so there was no longer room, even near the door. And he was speaking the word to them. <clears throat> so again, Peter's pretty important because not only is the first disciple called by Jesus, but now uh, he's providing lodging uh, for Jesus. And, of course, as we go through the gospel and we read gospels, or we read many passages where it refers to the, what we call the inner circle of Jesus' disciples, which was Peter, James, and John. And we see those three names linked together over and over. Uh, skipping quite a bit here into Mark 8, another thing that is, uh, makes Peter an important person, and again, we're skipping a, a lot of stuff in doing this in all of the uh, Gospels. <clears throat> but <clears throat> Peter was the first to identify Jesus as the Messiah. Mark 8, beginning with the 27th verse. 
And Jesus went out among his disciples to the villages of Caesarea Philippi, and on the way he questioned his disciples, saying to them, Who do people say that I am? And they told him, saying, John the Baptist, and others say Elijah, but still others, one of the prophets. And he continued to question them, But who do you say that I am? Peter answered and said to him, Thou art the Christ. And he warned him to tell no one about him. So he was the first to identify Jesus as the Christ, which of course is the Greek word for Messiah. Another thing that makes Peter one of the special people in uh, Jesus' life, he was one of the witnesses at the Transfiguration, going to Mark 9, uh, starting with the second verse. And six days later, Jesus took with him Peter and James and John and brought them up to a high mountain by themselves, and he was transfigured before them. And his garments became radiant and exceedingly white, as no launderer on earth can whiten them. And Elijah appeared to them along with Moses, and they were conversing with Jesus. And Peter answered and said to Jesus, Rabbi, it is good for us to be here. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> and let us make three tabernacles, one for you and one for Moses and one for Elijah. For he did not know what to answer, for they became terrified. Then a cloud formed overshadowing them, and a voice came out of the cloud. This is my beloved son. Listen to him. Well, skipping again a bit, of course we have the uh, <coughs> arrest of, of Jesus. <clears throat> Thank you. <clears throat> and uh, going to uh, Mark 14 now. And this is right after the uh, uh, communion for the, the Last Supper. Jesus, it's beginning in the 27th verse of Mark 14. Jesus said to them, You will all fall away because it is written, I will strike down the shepherd and the sheep shall be scattered. But after I have been raised, I will go before you to Galilee. But Peter said to him, Even though all may fall away, Yet I will not. And Jesus said to him, Truly I say to you, that you yourself this very night, before a cock crows twice, shall three times deny me. But Peter kept saying insistently, Even if I have to die with you, I will not deny you. And they all were saying the same thing too. And skipping then to... Uh, verse 66, uh, by this time, Jesus has been arrested, and uh, all of, most of the disciples, except Peter, have fled. So in, in Peter's, uh, you know, uh, he, he at least was brave enough to follow along to try to find out what was happening. And he's waiting in a courtyard and going on with the 66th verse. And as Peter was below in the courtyard, one of the servant girls of the high priest came, and seeing Peter warming himself, she looked at him and she said, You too were with Jesus the Nazarene. But he denied it, saying, I neither know nor understand what you're talking about. And he went out into the porch. And the maid saw him and began once more to say to the bystanders, This is one of them. But again he was denying it, and after a little while, the bystanders were again saying to Peter, Surely you are one of them, for you are a Galilean too. But he began to curse and swear, I do not know this fellow you're talking about. And immediately a cock crowed a second time, and Peter remembered how Jesus had made the remark to him, Before a cock crows twice, you will deny me three times. And he began to weep. So here's this person who was close to Jesus, provided lodging for him, traveled with him, saw the transfiguration, and yet 
denied him. But what happens next? Well, of course, we know what happens next. We have the crucifixion and the resurrection. And skipping now to John, um, the 20th chapter. <clears throat> Excuse me. First nine verses of John 20. Now on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene came early to the tomb while it was still dark and saw the stone already taken away from the tomb. And so she ran and came to Simon Peter and the other disciple whom Jesus loved and said to them, they've taken away the Lord out of the tomb and we do not know where they've laid him. Peter therefore went forth and the other disciple and they were going to the tomb. And the two were running together, and the other disciple ran ahead faster than Peter and came to the tomb first. And stooping and looking in, he saw the linen wrappings lying there, but he did not go in. Simon Peter, therefore, also came following him and entered the tomb. And he beheld the linen wrappings lying there, and the face cloth, which had been on his head, and lying with the linen wrappings, but rolled up in a place by itself. Now we'll skip over to Luke. Of course, Jesus, uh, as we know then, appeared to the disciples. And we'll go to Luke 24. <clears throat> 34th verse. I'll start actually a little before that. Beginning with the 33rd verse, and they arose that very hour and returned to Jerusalem and found gathered together the eleven of those who were with them and those who were with them, saying, The Lord has really risen and has appeared to Simon. So Peter was one of the first that Jesus appeared to, and of course he was the first to enter the tomb after the resurrection. Then we go back to John, 21st chapter. beginning with the 15th verse. So when they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, feed my lambs. He said to him again a second time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And he said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, shepherd my sheep. He said to him the third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was grieved because he said to him the third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Jesus said to him, tend my sheep. It's kind of a parallel there. Peter had denied Jesus three times. And now Jesus tells him three times to tend the sheep. So Jesus, or Peter became... Uh, then, as we know, a leader uh, amongst the apostles. He, uh, again, we're skipping a lot because there's simply not time to read all these texts, but he uh, spoke at Pentecost, a, a full chapter devoted to his sermon at Pentecost. He healed, he preached, and we're skipping now to Acts, fourth chapter. He's now becoming so zealous <clears throat> that is making a name for himself, he and the other uh, disciples, of course. And going to Acts 4, starting the 18th verse. <clears throat> and when they had summoned them, they commanded them not to speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John answered and said to him, whether it is right in the sight of God to give heed to you rather than to God, you be the judge, for we cannot stop speaking what we have seen and heard. <clears throat> and a little bit after that, we see in Acts 5, uh, Peter was thrown into prison, and an angel released him from prison. And here again, uh, there not happy with uh, his speaking. 
We'll read that beginning with the 18th verse of Acts 5. And they laid hands on the apostles and put them in a public jail. But an angel of the Lord during the night opened the gates of the prison and taking them out, he said, go your way, stand and speak to the people in the temple, the whole message of this life. And upon hearing this, they, they entered into the temple about daybreak and began to teach. Now when the high priest and his associates had come, they called the council together, even all the senate of the sons of Israel, and sent orders to the prison house for them to be brought. But the officers who came did not find them in the prison. And they returned and reported back, saying, We found the prison house locked quite securely, and the guards standing at the doors. But when we opened it up, we found no one inside. Now when the captain of the temple guard and the chief priests heard these words, they were greatly perplexed about them as to what would come of this. But someone came and reported to them, Behold, the men who you put in prison are standing in the temple and teaching the people. Then the captain went along with the officers and proceeded to bring them back without violence, for they were afraid of the people, lest they should be stoned. And when they had brought them, they stood them before the council, and the high priest questioned them, saying, we gave you strict orders not to continue uh, teaching in this name. And behold, you fill Jerusalem with your teaching and intend to bring this man's blood upon us. But Peter and the apostles answered and said, We must obey God rather than men. <clears throat> and skipping now to Acts 11. Uh, what happens here, I have to, uh, I'm skipping over some verses, so I'm going to tell you quickly what's going on. But here's where Peter made the first Gentile convert. Uh, a man named Cornelius, uh, who was a Roman centurion, but was what they called a, a God lover, which means he had accepted the God uh, of Israel and uh, had rejected pagan gods, but he had not become a full convert to uh, uh, Judaism. Uh, in any event, he had a vision, told him to go uh, call for this person, Peter, to come and visit him. Meanwhile, Peter has a similar vision. He says, go see this Cornelius. And he says, but he's a, he's a Roman, he's a Gentile. I'm not supposed to go see him. And he was told, yes, uh, you do. And, he, and there's a bit more of the story. We'll, we'll not go into all the details. But basically, he is convinced by this vision that he needs to go down there to see this Roman centurion. And when he goes, he finds out the Roman centurion has had this vision. And so he preaches to him this, the gospel. And the centurion and his household are baptized. Well, this is the first Gentile convert to Christianity, which is a pretty big thing. So now, uh, going on here with uh, <clears throat> Acts 11. <clears throat> now, the, um, um, Peter reports back to Jerusalem about this. Now, the apostles and the brethren who were throughout Judea heard that the Gentiles also had received the word of God. And when Peter came up to Jerusalem, those who were circumcised took issue with him, saying, You went to uncircumcised men and ate with them. But Peter began speaking and proceeded to explain to them in orderly sequence, saying, uh, I was in the city of Joppa praying, and in a trance I saw in a vision a certain object coming down like a great sheet lowered by four corners from the sky, and it came right down to me. And he goes on and explains the whole thing. And again, we're skipping because of time. So we'll skip to the 17th verse. If God therefore gave them to the same gift, gave to them the same gift as he gave to us also after believing the Lord Jesus Christ, who was I that I could stand in God's way? And when they had heard this, they quieted down and glorified God, saying, Well then, God has granted the Gentiles also the repentance that leads to life. 
<clears throat> so again, a very important thing in Peter's life is making this first Gentile convert. So look what happened to Peter. He denied Christ. He denied him after the, uh, at, uh, before the crucifixion. And yet now all at once, he's preaching, he's evangelizing, he's going against the wishes of the officers who tell him not to preach, and uh, he's become uh, quite a leader. What happened? What's the reason for the change? Well, of course, the reason for the change, pretty obvious, the resurrection. But you'd say, you know, he knew, he believed in resurrection before. All of them did. All of the disciples did. But, <clears throat> and Jesus had told them clearly enough, many times, that he was to die and be resurrected. Somehow, they didn't get it. We'll go back to Mark. <clears throat> ninth verse, ninth chapter. <clears throat> Starting with the 31st uh, verse. <clears throat> For he was de teaching his disciples and telling them, The Son of Man is to be delivered up into the hands of men, and they will kill him. And when he has been killed, he will rise again after three days. But they did not understand this statement, and they were afraid to ask him. So you'd say, why didn't they understand? He told them plainly. Well, you know, you have to come a little slack. Here they were, uh, following along with Jesus, who was preaching, was healing people. Everything was looking great. He tells them something like this. They wonder, you know, I don't get it. Why would that happen? Maybe he's just, you know, speaking some kind of uh, who knows what. It, it's symbolic in some way. That's probably what went through their minds. So as simple as he made it, we understand it, but we're centuries later. We know the whole story. They didn't know the whole story yet. And even though they'd been told, they doubted. But now, Peter knows the truth because he has been a witness to the resurrection. And that makes the difference. Now, of course, we're not witnesses. We believe through faith. But one thing we have is the testimony of those who were witnesses. And we'll go now to 1 Peter. <clears throat> Chapter 1, starting with the 16th verse. I'm, no, I wrote... I'm sorry. Uh, 2 Peter. Chapter 1. Starting with the 16th verse. For we did not follow cleverly devised tales when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but we were eyewitnesses to his majesty. For when he received honor and glory from God the Father, such an utterance as this was made to him by the majestic glory, this is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. And we ourselves heard this utterance made from heaven when we were with him, on the holy mountain. And then now going back to 1 Peter. First chapter, verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his great mercy has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to obtain an inheritance which is imperishable and undefiled and will not fade away reserved in heaven for you who are protected by the power of God through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. And then we'll skip to the 23rd verse. For you have been born again, not of seed which is perishable, but imperishable, that is, to the living and abiding word of God. So here's Peter now, eyewitness to the resurrection and proclaiming it to, uh, to whoever he wrote that letter to, uh, but also to us centuries later as we read that letter and we have the word of an eyewitness to the resurrection. So 
remembering those words, it helps us to move forward in faith, believing that Jesus was resurrected and so will be at the end times. We don't know when that's going to be. No one knows. As the scripture says, no one but God knows, not even Christ knows. But it will come. And through Peter's word and Peter's life, we can have faith in that resurrection. Now let's pray. Father, we thank you for the opportunity we have to worship together in a free nation where we can worship as we see fit. And we pray that through the life of Peter and his experience and his witness, we too will have true faith in the resurrection of Jesus and in the sacrifice of Jesus in which we were baptized as Annie was this morning. And we'll look forward then to the return of Christ when all of faith will be resurrected to live in the kingdom here on earth. And we pray this through Christ's name.